Well, tonight we're going to finish our Daniel seminar with chapters 11 and 12. If we were going to go all the way through chapter 11, we'd have to have a second meeting because it's a very long chapter. And I'm not sure how many are interested in all the details, but chapter 11 starts out with Medo-Persia because by the time this was given, Babylon was already gone. And so it starts with Medo-Persia, then it goes to Greece and then to Rome, and uh, it gives a lot of interesting details so that people can know that it's correct. I'm sure most everyone's heard of Cleopatra at least. Uh, she's in there, and a number of other fairly well-known uh, figures from history. And uh, so it, it makes it possible, if you look carefully through all those verses and understand what they're talking about, it gives you a, a certainty that this uh, book of Daniel is exactly right. But we will start with um, verses 31 to 35. That's toward the end of the chapter. And in this, it expands some of the information that was given in very small form in other places in the prophecies. And it's about the Little Horn Tower uh, that plucked up three horns. And so here we look at verse 31. It says, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily. Now here, uh, the supplied word is sacrifice again, but actually that word tends to give it a wrong interpretation. So it would be better if they hadn't put that in there. The daily is not talking about the sanctuary, but it's talking about the daily power of whoever is in control. And, of course, the last one before the papacy was Rome. So Rome was going to lose their daily uh, control of the earth. And so it says, uh, shall take away the daily, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Now the abomination that maketh, maketh desolate is a direct reference about the papacy and this is one of the main things it would do. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. In other words, uh, not all the conquering happened by warfare, but some of the conquering took place by telling lies and giving you know, flatteries that cause people to think, oh, they're a wonderful uh, power, and they got connected with them, and then they found out it was a little different afterward. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. So this power doesn't really know God, but there would be faithful people who knew God and God would inspire them to do amazing things even during this uh, power of the little horn. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. So here we see the persecuting power again, 
And it's always talking about that whenever it talks about the little horn power. It's talking about the persecution that they would do against the true people of God. By the sword, many were killed that way. Many were burned at the stake by the flame. Uh, many suffered captivity. And, uh, of course, they, they were spoiled. Their possessions were taken away and so on. It says it would be many days. Now, it has already identified how long it would be previously. And we looked at that 1,260 years this power would do those things toward the people of God. Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. So here we see, uh, and we won't go into all the details of what that's talking about, but it's, a, it's an expansion of what the uh, little horn power would do uh, in the future. Now, there is some difference of opinion in this next uh, section, but I lean toward Erasmus' understanding of this. And so in verses 36 to 39, we see another power. And this power is France. It's France during the time when France persecuted the worst possible uh, persecution, they actually drove every single Protestant out of their country or killed them, one or the other. And uh, many, you know, died and many were uh, chose to escape rather than to uh, suffer that fate. So it says here in 36, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself, and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined <coughs> shall be done. Verse 37, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Verse 38, But in his estate shall he honor the God of horses, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall be he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Now here we see the um, what they called the God of reason, goddess actually of reason. And they uh, when they inaugurated this they brought in one of the, the prostitutes and they exalted her in their legislature and worshipped her in their legislature. And this was uh, certainly, the Catholic Church never did anything like that. Uh, they always profess to serve the true God. They do, the Pope does consider he is equal to God or even above God but he, he doesn't do the things that this describes. And verse 39, Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, 
and shall divide the land again. So here's all of the key things that was a part of this uh, hatred against the Huguenots. They were the ones that lived in France. And as things progressed, you know, then after they had uh, dealt, well, I guess first, actually, before they dealt with the, with the Huguenots, they dealt with the Catholic Church because they were fed up with the abuses that had been practiced on them. Then they went after the Huguenots, and then they went after each other. And it was just, you know, one ruling power after another, and the, the ones that had been in power would be wiped out. The guillotine was the big tool in those times, and they just wiped out huge uh, numbers of people. And finally, uh, it came to an end. It was, uh, I don't remember how many times the power turned over to somebody else. Now, in verse 11, I mean, chapter 11, verses 40 to 44. In this uh, chapter, there's an a ongoing battle between the king of the north and the king of the south. These were two of the areas that the generals of Greece controlled. And apparently, you know, they still were able to keep on going uh, to some degree afterwards. And uh, King of the North uh, is the one that we're going to look at right here. King of the South is uh, Egypt area. And the King of the North in this passage was, was Turkey. Which, you know, basically was where the Roman power kind of withered away. They moved their capital from Rome to Constantinople, and so it's, uh, it's the final part of that. Verse 40, And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. Now the time of the end in Daniel is 1798. That's when the time of the end begins. So that kind of puts a date on this that it's near the time of the end or in the time of the end. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So the king of the north was to be the winner, even though the king of the south had started this uh, battle, the king of the north would win. And the reason they could have ships is that the Mediterranean Sea is in between these two powers, and so they, they would have ships sometimes in their battles. Now verse 41 he shall enter also into the glorious land. Now in, in the Old Testament, of course, the glorious land was the land of the Jews. Jerusalem would be the headquarters of that. And it's interesting, God must see that as an important place because when the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven, it lands in that same spot. So, he shall enter into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand. So there's three uh, places that he wasn't able to subdue, Edom and Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. So that's where the king of the south is, and, and Egypt is not going to escape. But 
he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his death. So there's complete victory for the king of the north. But then things change in verse 44. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. But this will not be successful. And in verse 45, it says, And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Again, would have to represent Jerusalem, the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. Now if we trace the outcome of that battle, uh, we find that Turkey ended up losing in the end. They did conquer Egypt, but then they lost. And in fact, it was one of those prophecies that during the Millerite movement that they studied out and they made a prediction that on August 11, 1840, Turkey would surrender to the Axis powers, which was England and its allies, and interestingly enough, it happened on that exact day that they surrendered uh, their, their power. So it says none were going to help him. He would come to his end. None would help him. And Turkey hasn't been any, you know, thing to deal with since that time. Now, in Bible prophecy, there are sometimes is more than one application. And I believe that this is possible that there is a last day application to this final verse, at least, verse 45. And when we're looking at things that are still future, we it's very difficult to be sure you know, until it actually happens. But I have heard of some things that add up to a possibility. Now at some point it would seem that the king of the north has to change to somebody else. And the most popular view is that the king of the north is the Catholic Church. If that is true, and it probably is from all that, you know, listen to the different interpretations that people give. Then there is an interesting development that I heard about. Now, obviously, between the seas is going to be between the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. And the focal point in, in these verses is what happens to Jerusalem. And a friend of mine, who's passed away now, made a visit to Jerusalem. And he noticed something, a building that was being built. And it was uh, kind of a hush-hush building that was being built. And he questioned around and he couldn't really find out too much about this building, but <clears throat> there was another building that was built in uh, the Dominican Republic. And this was built by the papacy a number of years ago. It was also a hush-hush building. And uh, downstairs in the basement, there are torture chambers and they 
have passageways that go out into the ocean so that they can dispose of the remains, you know, uh, by just pushing it out into the water. In that building, there is an office for every country in the world. And on the roof of the building, there is, uh, they have lights that are capable of projecting, I forget how tall the image was, of the Pope for, you know, many feet in the air. So that's visible a long distance. Well, the same group of people are building a building in Jerusalem. And what it seems to me that is possible is that the impersonation of Jesus that Satan is going to do in the last days is going to tie in with that building. And people are going to think that the Messiah finally came. As you know, the Jews do not accept Jesus as the Messiah. And we're told that if Jesus had been a selfish individual, they would have accepted him. So they'll have no problem accepting Satan as the true Messiah. And of course, this will uh, connect with the Catholic Church. I don't know exactly how uh, the connection will be made, but uh, that's sort of what I'm thinking could happen. But since it's future, if it doesn't happen, you know, we can't, uh, we'll, we'll know. When the right interpretation happens, we'll know what it is. Now we do know that the papacy is going to exist twice. And so if we were to back up and, and read that, not thinking of Turkey, but thinking of the papacy, it would uh, fit also. And uh, Revelation is very clear, chapter 13, that it will exist twice. Starting at verse three, and I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed. If we track down this chapter, we see it's talking about the same power that we find in Daniel. So, first of all, it's wounded to death, but then the deadly wound was healed. If we study history, from all the powers that have ever been great powers, none of them had a second time, except the papacy. They're the only ones. So it makes it easy to figure out who it is. So his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. That's the way it was the first time. All the world wondered after the beast, and the second time it's gonna be the same. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Well, there is one, and that's Jesus. And he is going to make war with him. And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things. And notice, that's a quotation from Daniel, that this little horn would have a mouth that would speak great things. And blasphemies. So the great things included blasphemy. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. So there's that same time period that we have in the book of Daniel, 42 months. It refers to it three different ways. Time, times, Dividing of time, 42 months, and 1,260 years. All three are identical. It's obvious that God really wants us to know who it is. He doesn't want us to be confused about this power. 
Now, we generally consider that the deadly wound that was given by Berthier, the French general, who took the Pope prisoner, and for some time, Popes were excommunicating each other because there were several Popes claiming power, and uh, it was kind of a mess there for a while, and people lost their confidence in a power that was like that. So, uh, but later, after that 1798 experience, the deadly wound was going to heal. And we usually think of 1929 as the beginning. The reason why it's the beginning is that the Italian government gave to the papacy political authority over the Vatican. The Vatican's like a small city of its own. And so at that point, the Pope was not just a religious leader, but he was a political leader as well. And from that time on, as we look at the history of the Catholic Church, it has been growing in power, and more and more people are looking up to the papacy to be a blessing. And uh, it looks to me like the wound is uh, pretty close to fully healed already at this moment. Then uh, same chapter, verses 6 through 9. And he opened his mouth and blasphemed me against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. So there's a lot of blasphemy going on by this power. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. So now it's the second time of power and the Catholic Church is going to make war against the saints again. And to overcome them and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Not quite all. There is a remnant, the Bible says, but it identifies what group are worshiping him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the land slain from the foundation of the world. And then it says, if any man have an ear, in other words, one ear is gone, you only have one left. If you have one ear, and if any man have an ear, let him hear. So, as we look at this power that has two kinds of universal strength to where they can actually persecute the people of God. And obviously, from what we've studied already, that this is during the investigative judgment because it mentions there's a group <coughs> that don't worship this power. And that's the ones whose names have stayed in the book of life. All the rest whose names are not in the book of life, they worship him. So uh, Revelation and Daniel really go together very well. Now we'll go to the final chapter. It's a very short one. <coughs> Verse 1, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. Now Michael we saw last time, I believe, in chapter 10, Michael is Jesus. It's a, it's a wartime name for Michael, I mean for Jesus. And so... <coughs> It's interesting, it says that Jesus stands for his people. Now in this situation, uh, first it says stand up, which denotes finishing the investigative judgment. But the next one says standeth for the children of thy people. 
And you remember we read in, in uh, yeah, I forget the book now, Zechariah, I think. We read that uh, Jesus is going to stand in our place in the investigator judgment. Every person that has trusted him to take their sins and to carry their sins and also has allowed Jesus to give them the victory over those sins through his power, then he will stand in their place. And obviously, it's easy to pass the judgment as Jesus stands in our place. So there, there's a reference here to that. And, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. So there have been times of trouble all through the history of this world. But this one is going to be far, far above any of the others. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So this final time of trouble, while it will be hard on God's people, uh, they will all be delivered. Not one will die during that time. They will suffer a lot because the whole world is suffering tremendously. So this is actually the time spoken of in Revelation 15, verses 6 and 7. And the seven angels came out of the temple. That's the sanctuary in heaven. Having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles, and one of the four beasts came unto the seven angels, or gave, excuse me, unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And chapter 14 pointed out, when it was talking about the mark of the beast, it pointed out that this wrath of God has no mercy in it. All of the times of trouble that have existed before, God's mercy has been mingled. I mean, we see it almost on a daily basis. They have tremendous disaster. And when you listen to the number of people that got killed, it's small compared to the size of the disaster. And so it's because God's mercy is mingled with all the things that happened and have happened in the past. But once probation closes and Michael stands up, then this is punishment. Because no one is going to accept Jesus after that point. And so that hasn't already. And so uh, there is no mercy mingled with it. And these seven plagues are described in chapter 16. And it's not only the plagues. There's going to be war going on. There's going to be disasters bigger than the ones we're experiencing now. You know, floods and, and uh, tornadoes and tidal waves and earthquakes. and er It's all going to be going on at the same time. And so this is what is being talked about here. The time of trouble such as never was uh, since there was a nation. Verse 2 in Daniel 12 says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So after the time of trouble is finished or close to being finished, we have a, a resurrection. But it's a different one than what Revelation speaks about. So we call it a special resurrection. And in this one, godly people come up in the resurrection, but wicked people come up 
in the resurrection. So it's a special one. And we can find from some of the verses of the Bible who it's talking about. In Matthew 27, 64, Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So here is the high priest that Jesus is addressing. And he's saying, you know, you can do what you want with me right now. But in the future, you're going to see me coming in the clouds of heaven. And you're going to be sorry. You did what you did. But it's too late at that point. So at least we know for sure that there are that those who were leaders in the crucifixion of Jesus are going to come up in that special resurrection to see the literal Jesus that they had persecuted. And no doubt there are other key individuals that have uh, tortured and mistreated God's people that they will come up to see Jesus come, that they were fighting against Jesus. Also, in the chapter 14 of Revelation, verse 13, which actually I believe is a part of the third angel's message, but usually people cut it off at verse 12. But I think verse 13 belongs with the third angel's message. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right. right. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. So here, anyone who was used by God to deliver the third angel's message to the world, and it's really the all three messages, but especially the group that gave the third angel's message has a special blessing, and that is explained in Daniel what that blessing is. They are going to come up in that special resurrection so that they can actually witness the coming of Jesus. All they missed out on was the persecution and, you know, what happened after the close of probation. But they don't miss out on witnessing the second coming of Jesus. Now, how do we know that this is a special resurrection? Well, in Revelation 20, where it talks about the two uh, major resurrections in verse 6 and then in 4 it says blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection why because they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years so here we have the ones whose names stayed in the book of life and they are uh, resurrected to go home with Jesus uh, plus the ones that are alive to also go home with him. Also in verse 5 it says, But the rest of the dead lived not again till the thousand years were finished. In other words, they died at the beginning when Jesus came. They died at the beginning of the thousand years. And they stayed dead the whole thousand years, but at the end, there was a resurrection. It doesn't say that directly, but you can see that's what it means. They didn't live again until the thousand years were finished. So that's the resurrection of the wicked. At the beginning of the thousand years is the resurrection of the righteous. And then just previous to that first resurrection is the special resurrection 
so that they can see that small black cloud coming and witness the second coming of Jesus. Okay, verse 3. And they that be wise shall shine <coughs> as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. In other words, when it all comes to an end, the people that have been winning souls, they're going to shine in the tremendous brightness because all of those people are going to be so grateful for what they did to get them prepared to be able to go home with Jesus. It also reflects back on right now that the most valuable work for us to do is to save souls, to help people be ready for the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. So, you know, it's repeatedly uh, told us that this book is going to be sealed until after 1798. Now, that was not 100% true because there were individuals here and there that discovered the truth of Daniel. But generally speaking, it is true that, you know, God would bring about a tremendous knowledge and people would be interested in the knowledge of the books of Daniel and Revelation. And here's a very misunderstood phrase. It says, Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And so many uh, evangelists have talked about the invention of the automobile and the, and the airplane and the computer and all these things. That's not a big concern to God that he would put that in the Bible. Yes, it has happened, but this is talking about if you look at it in the original language, it's talking about people who are studying the book of Daniel and their eyes are going back and forth on the pages of the Bible trying to figure out what is this talking about. And of course, William Miller was uh, one of the first in the final uh, understanding of the book of Daniel. And so, more and more, even now, I'm surprised we didn't get more people to come to this seminar because I've held others and we've always had none of them has come to, uh, you know, to listen. Because there's a curiosity that God has put in the hearts of many people. What is this book talking about? Well, that was predicted right here. The people are going to want to know. Verse 5, 5 to 7 actually. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, and one on this side of the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. This goes back to, you know, chapter 10, because 10 through 12 is kind of a... Um, it flows, you know, sequentially together. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? In other words, when, when is the end going to actually happen? When, when are all these prophecies going to be finished? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half, 
And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So here's a series of three different uh, time prophecies. And it kind of covers all three here in a general way, but we're going to look at each one specifically. We've already covered this one, uh, time, times, and a half. In Daniel 8, 25, it said, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. So this is a direct reference to the Sabbath truth, but especially to persecution as well. And that would begin in 538 A.D., when the Pope achieved full power. Uh, or in other words, we could say, the abomination that maketh desolate is fully set up. And then, if you just take the 1260 years and carry it out, it comes to 1798, when the Pope was taken prisoner by the French General Berthier. Then, we start with another one in verses 8 to 10. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? You notice that Daniel, all the way through from chapter 8, he's been wishing he knew more because he knows there's important information here, but, you know, what, what is it that's really going to happen? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Poor Daniel, he cannot understand it all because it's not supposed to be explained till later. Verse uh, 10, many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. So God will reveal it to his people, but those that don't want to follow God, they'll never know, they'll never be able to figure it out. In fact, often they cast reflection on this interpretation because they don't think it makes sense. But the true people of God will know. Now, verse 11 gives the second one. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, but we need to get rid of the word sacrifice, from the time that the daily shall be taken away and the abomination that make a desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. So this would be one thousand two hundred and ninety years. Thirty more years. There's another key date in regard to the development of the Little Horn Tower in 508 A.D. when Clovis, who was the first pope, received recognition from Roman, the Roman consul and this gave him victory over the third Aryan tribe and this you know, then went to uh, 1798. He would have that power. Also, I found some other interesting facts. Also in 508, the papacy was triumphant so far as paganism was concerned. 
So they became the victor in the battle over a religion. And yet they didn't have the power that they would have at the 538 date. Another one, uh, in 508 terminated, or excuse me, 508 terminated United Resistance to the development of the papacy. <coughs> In other words, now it could grow without being having to fight battles and so on to grow. The question of supremacy between Frank and Goth, between the Catholic and the Aryan religions, had then been settled in favor of the Catholic. So those are events that uh, culminated in 508. And then it would take 30 years for the abomination that make it desolate to get set up. But once it was set up, then it would become a persecuting power to those who disagreed with her uh, for 1260 years. So, the 1290 year prophecy starts with 508, and the 1260 year prophecy starts with 538. Both apply to the, to the uh, Catholic Church. And then there's the third one. In uh, verse, uh, verse 12. Blessed is he that waiteth, and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. Now here, we have to look for some kind of event that would be a blessed event. And if we take the beginning of the 1335 days or years <coughs> to be 508, notice the sequence of these prophecies. The first one starts 538. Second one backs up to 508. The third one also starts with 508, and then it will continue until 1843. Now in 1843, the most blessed thing uh, was taking place. It was the greatest revival of godliness and interest in spiritual things that had happened since Pentecost. And so this is when the height of it actually. Apparently, in 1843, there were approximately 300,000 people expecting the return of Jesus. They were all excited about it. And although we see 1844 as being the most uh, significant date, which it is in regard to the judgment, but they were only able to get about 50,000 people interested in the second coming of Jesus that time. So 1843 was the height of the blessed experience that uh, the Millerites would have as they so eagerly looked for the coming of Jesus. 